I'm Scarlett Food. This is ETFIQ, where we focus on the access risks and rewards offered by exchange traded funds. Couch potatoes rejoice. If the Super Bowl is too old school for you, there's an ETF that bets on the future of sports. Goldman goes active. The firm seeks approval for an actively managed ETF that hides its secret sauce. And pitfalls of passive ownership. How airlines show us what happens when competitors have common owners. Love them or hate them, ETFs are a fixture in the financial markets. And Bloomberg's Eric Valchunas is our ETF pro, and he reads flows like tea leaves. So what do you see out there? <laughs> Thank you, Scarlett. Yeah, so a bit of a mixed bag. It's been this nice, steady risk on. Both the traders and retail have just been loving life. A little more mixed. Something has spooked the trading crowd a little bit. But first, let's go to the risk on type flows. This is good. This international developed U.S. equities. There's uh, tech. Uh, but look, that 7 to 10 year treasury, that would be a little risk off. I also find GSLC is interesting. That's a multi factor ETF now, 8 billion. That's a good win for Goldman right there. Little value in treasuries, right? So a little risk um, off here. Let's look at the outflows. And that's where this really, I think, this story gets more compelling. <clears throat> look at the outflows. You've got junk bonds, uh, uh, spy, small caps, and emerging markets. This is a who's who of risk on ETFs for the trading crowd. So something has spooked them. Although it looks to be a little short-lived based on the volume, let's look at the traders versus the allocators chart that I love to show. These two types of investors have been on the same page for weeks, right? But look, the traders are a little bit spooked. Two weeks in a row of outflows. Allocators still doing what they do. But the trading crowd getting spooked is interesting. We'll see if this, you know, portends anything bigger. But for now, uh, you know, obviously the slightest thing has them a little nervous. Yeah, and that little thing that's got them nervous is uh, the coronavirus. Now let's bring in Annie Massa and Claire Ballantyne of Bloomberg News. Annie covers the asset management industry, and Claire <coughs> is a cross asset reporter. Claire, let me start with you because the coronavirus um, scare triggered a risk off shift across geographies and across asset classes. The effect on U.S. stocks, though, has been fairly short lived. What are you seeing? when it comes to some of the other risky assets out there? Well, for ETFs, clearly, investors are concerned about the coronavirus. We saw emerging markets funds being affected by that. We also saw HYG, one of the high-yield ETFs, see its largest outflow on record in wake of the coronavirus. So it's something to definitely look out for. And it's something that I'm sure people are talking about as well, Annie. All three of you just returned from an ETF conference in Florida. And one of the big themes from the event was how a 60-40 portfolio may not, no longer protect investors when the everything up rally falls apart and things start heading south. The question then becomes, where do you go for that protection? That's exactly right. So at the conference, one thing that came out and something that GMO has really been talking about for a while is that in the next seven years, you might actually start to see U.S. large cap equities really selling off. And the, the place to look in the wake of that would be uh, emerging markets. Another thing that came up was liquid alts and how they might start really fitting into ETF wrappers. So that was another big conversation, how you might look for hedge fund type returns or PE type returns, how they might fit into ETFs. Right. It's especially if you have 60 40 and you go into bonds and bonds are selling off with equities that's not really much protection for you so it's interesting that they've come up with these alternatives eric another big theme was the invasion of the ants the act of non-transparency um, no surprise there especially with a bunch of uh, actively managed non-transparent etfs coming to market pretty soon yeah i mean uh five years ago it was smart beta three years ago it was all crypto this year it's the ants right and it seems like there's two sides if you're inside the etf teradome as i call it now you're very bearish you just like, look, guys, you're not going to have a lot of luck here. It's brutal. And this report shows it from Cerulli that the ETF issuers themselves don't see a lot of optimism here. However, if you talk to the ant issuers and the people who make the structures, boy, are they bullish. They think this is going to be a big deal. So, uh, Claire, what, what did you find in terms of, you know, listening to people debate this issue at the conference? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. This was the biggest topic at the conference. Everyone agreed that this is the next big thing in 2020. The question is, what's going to happen when these funds actually launch. Um, some are saying that they're going to gather assets. Others are more skeptical. Mm -hmm. uh, rarely do you see investors demanding less transparency in what they're holding. So I think, you know, we're having these great talks about it. The question is going to be when they launch, then what happens? It always comes down to performance, right? Annie, climate change was topic number one at Davos earlier this month. So it's fitting that ESG was front and center at the industry conference. 2019, we know, was a big year for flows into ESG. 
I guess the question here is, will the assets continue to follow the hype? Because the hype has only gotten bigger. That's right. You saw ESG assets and ETFs uh, hit records last year. And the question is whether you can really carry that forward. There is a lot of attention being paid to ESG funds, issuers coming to market with new funds and really racing to get new funds on the market. So that was in focus. There was another focus on how you might apply ESG to fixed income, whether it matters there. Um, and also just how to define ESG. I think there's a lot of uh, questions still that investors and asset managers have around what makes sense as ESG. Should it be an exclusionary screen or something else? Is ESG a factor, Eric? That's a big question. If it can get alpha, I think people would add a little on. The bigger question, if it's not that, and it's to clean up your portfolio, one of the ETFs that was really highlighted was SUSL. I think it's the largest one. Mm -hmm. It doesn't own Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix. To me, this is like a car without an engine. So I wonder if people are going to replace their whole portfolio. Do they really understand they aren't getting those kind of engine type stocks? Unless the world is changing. And uh, Annie, we were talking about this earlier. Uh, maybe you shouldn't be looking at a car with an engine. You should be looking at an electric vehicle. Different world. <laughs> well said. All right, um, Claire, this was your first year attending the ETF conference. Uh, Eric likes to call it the Comic-Con of ETFs. What did you think? What was your impression? Well, I gotta say, no offense, Eric, I think ETF people are way more fun than I thought initially. <laughs> uh, Thank it, you. It was great to meet people, it was awesome location. You know, there were cocktails. One issuer was promoting um, their fund with space-themed ice cream because it was a space ETF. So I think it's the closest thing to spring break you'll get outside of college. Well, it was in Florida in January, so that certainly helps. Um, Annie, there's always a celebrity or two attending this conference as well. Yes, so I moderated a panel, and right after my panel, Derek Jeter was waiting backstage to go on. So I got to shake his hand, and I was like, I'm Annie, and he was like, I'm Derek. So that was- And you said, cool. I know. I was like, I certainly know. Uh, but I was wondering why so many people were there for a panel on ETF liquidity risks, so I think it might have been that they were waiting for him. No, it's all about liquidity <laughs> risks. Eric, you're a veteran of these events. What was your impression this time around? Uh, it was good. This thing continues to get bigger and bigger companies involved. To me, that was the big thing. Also, also, a little more people wearing jeans. So I, I like that trend. I hope we can all just sort of go <laughs> casual in the future. So there's this interesting mix of ties, suits, and then total like techie jean type uh, characters. Well, apart from the course for disruptors, right? All right, our thanks to Bloomberg's Annie Massa and Claire Ballantyne. Now coming up, questioning the power of the giant money managers such as BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, the big three. We dig into why the FTC wants buyers and sellers to identify their largest shareholders. And one ETF that caught our attention this week, the iShares MSCI China ETF, ticker MCHI, reflects investors being increasingly spooked by the coronavirus. The fund's on course for its worst month since May, when the U.S. and China ratcheted up trade tensions. By the way, you can find all these charts on the Bloomberg at GTV Go. Don't forget to check it out. This is ETF IQ. I'm Scarlet Fu. This is ETF IQ. Let's take you through the ETF life cycle, which has three main stages. And step one is the filing. The paperwork for the Goldman Sachs Multi Asset Income ETF is now in. Goldman is licensing Presidian's active share structure for this active non transparent fund, also known as ANTS. Goldman's ETF will invest in other ETFs to get exposure to fixed income and international equities. And speaking of Presidian, the first funds using the structure launch this week. In step two of our life cycle, American Century debuts its focused dynamic growth ETF and focused large cap value ETF under the tickers FGD and FLV. They're actively managed, but don't reveal their holdings daily. And for some, the final stage is liquidation. The Wisdom Tree Balanced Income Fund has closed shop. The passively managed WBAL was a traditional 60-40 global fund, but like many ETFs that invest across asset classes, WBAL did not attract enough investors. Time to get passive aggressive and track the tensions between active and passive investing. Now, the massive shift in assets from active to passive funds means index fund companies have become some of the biggest owners of listed companies. So antitrust regulators are now asking questions about whether this common ownership could harm competition. 
Let's bring in Marcel Kahan. He is the George T. Lowy Professor of Law at NYU School of Law. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Now, let's put things in context here because passive funds own about 17% of the S&P 500. And given the concentration of assets between Vanguard and BlackRock, it means they're the top two or three owners of most S&P 500 companies at a range of four to 8% of shares outstanding. Tell us why this would be enough to raise the FTC's concerns. Well, the FTC is probably going to be interested in looking whether the effects that these funds who own shares in multiple companies, including companies that compete with each other, have the effect of lessening competition among these companies. Now, when it comes to evidence that increased common ownership of competing firms changes corporate behavior, there was a study done a couple years ago on how airline fares were higher because of common ownership uh, from different big funds. Do you think certain industries are more vulnerable to this, or is this something that is visible across industries? Definitely industries that are already fairly concentrated with a small number of competitors are going to be more vulnerable than industries that have 10, 20, or 50 competing firms. Now, we're looking here at the top shareholders of American Airlines. If you look at it, Vanguard owns about 10%, just under 10%. It's the third largest shareholder. BlackRock, by the way, isn't even in the top five, and those are your index fund companies. Could index fund companies really have that big of an impact then? Well, that is the question. A lot of people are very dubious about that because index fund companies do not communicate much about business strategy with the companies that they own. They are very, very passive. Mm -hmm. And passive means you don't get involved, you vote your shares, but you don't do much else. So the question is, how exactly, if it happens, how exactly does it happen that index funds lead to less competition? Okay, so that's a really interesting point because we don't know yet the mechanism by which the anti-competitive behavior occurs. We don't know how exactly it happens. If you're saying that index funds tend to be passive, um, do the common owners basically by being too passive get in the way or do they get in the way by being too active? Well, it's hard to see how they would get into the way by being too passive because most shareholders are also very, very passive. Individual investors are very, very passive. So if index funds are passive, just like individual investors are, What's the big harm? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, certainly that's something that uh, those in the ETF industry in the passive world have raised. The thing about BlackRock and Vanguard is they're not exactly friends, right? They're pretty competitive with one another. Is there reason for the FTC to think that they would be working with each other, actively working with each other, when they tend to be passive as it is as shareholders? Well, for one, there is a big difference between Vanguard and BlackRock. Both are very, very big in index funds, but okay. BlackRock also is very, very big in active funds. Well, Vanguard tends to be not big in active funds. They have a few active funds, but most of them are not managed by Vanguard, but by other companies, like PrimeCap that mm -hmm. you had up on the screen before. Okay, good point. So, Looking ahead, what's a good solution to this? You mentioned how Vanguard is both active and passive along with BlackRock. What do you do? Do you split up a company like Vanguard or BlackRock or do you limit, put a limit on how much a passive index fund can own of any one company? I think right now we don't have enough evidence to take these drastic measures, but what the FTC is doing is looking at communications that happen, see whether these communications take place and whether these communications are suspicious, that is exactly what the government should be doing at this point. We have some preliminary evidence mm -hmm. based on statistics. Now we want to see, is there a concrete evidence? Are you going to find a smoking gun when you're looking for it? Now, should the FTC also look into active mutual funds as part of this investigation? Definitely. Nobody, nobody has pins this down to passive funds. Okay, right, because I'm thinking someone like Paul Icahn can be the biggest shareholder in uh, companies that are in talks to merge. Uh, for instance, Xerox and HP. Certainly that would raise regulators' concerns as well. And so there's another big difference between Icahn and Vanguard. We talk as if Vanguard were a shareholder, but Vanguard actually doesn't own any shares. They are Vanguard individual, Vanguard funds own the shares, but these shares are really owned by people like you and me who are Vanguard investors. So why is it that Vanguard management would go out on a limb, do something that's possibly illegal, do something that would definitely hurt Vanguard's reputation mm -hmm. if the beneficiaries are people like you and me who won't even know that Vanguard is doing that and won't even be grateful for Vanguard, but anybody who buys an index funds gets the same benefit.
right, great stuff. Professor Marcel Cahan of NYU Law School, thank you so much for giving us a lot to think about here. Now, coming up, the big game is this weekend in Miami, but the future of sports growth might be in eSports. So next, we dig into an ETF looking to give investors exposure to this winning sector. And for a drill down into all of our ETF content, check out Bloomberg.com slash markets slash ETFs. This is ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Food. This is ETF IQ. For every ETF that invests in a region or sector, it's not long before a copycat appears. Emerging markets are ripe for a comeback after years of underperformance. For those determined to find a growth tilt to a value play, EM Internet companies offer an opportunity. Kevin Carter is founder of EMQQ, the Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce ETF. But before we talk to him, Eric Balchunas is going to give us the drill down into that fund. Thank you, Scarlett. Yeah, EMQQ is a surprise indie hit. Uh, look at the uh, assets here, 440 million uh, for charging 86 basis points is a minor miracle. Uh, and the performance is why that happened, which I'll get to in a minute. But basically the premise here is that EEM and these other emerging markets ETFs don't have too much in terms of communications and tech exposure. They're building up, but they really don't have that much. So here they're just gonna capture internet and e-commerce uh, companies in the emerging markets. Let's look at the breakdown of the holdings, which to me there's a couple things to point out here. First is you got to know you're getting a ton of China in this ETF. EMQQ is 52% China, and the P.E. ratio of EMQQ is about 50. So again, we're looking about double the U.S., so it's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of valuation, high valuations here. Let's look at the performance of EMQQ versus EEM, uh, and I also put an FDN here, which is the Internet ETF in the U.S. So this is the FANG names, and they're crushing it, obviously. Here's EMQQ, though, and here's EEM. So relative to EM, this has been crushing EM, but still relative to US internet, China is here. So you could argue there's room for upside or you could argue that it's gotta come back down to earth with EM. So Scarlett, this is a shiny object moment mm. in effect and that's why you have the assets at a half a billion. All right, good stuff, Eric. Thank you so much. Now, still with me is Kevin Carter, founder of EMQQ. And China makes up 57% of EMQQ. So the name says EM, but China is the majority of this fund. Kevin, what is the case for buying EMQQ over, say, KWeb, which is the Crane Shares China Internet Fund that focuses specifically on China? Sure. Well, China is the biggest part of the story, and there is a lot of overlap with KWeb and EMQQ. But, you know, it's not just a China story. This is an emerging market story. This is Africa. This is India. This is Brazil. And, and the story is that, you know, there's billions of people joining the consumer class, and they're getting their first ever computer in form of a smartphone. And also their first ever internet connection uh, on that uh, first ever computer and they're becoming consumers uh, sort of as digital natives and in the growth China is the biggest it will be the biggest for the foreseeable future if not ever but India has a ton of opportunity there's a billion right. people in India that still don't have a smartphone. So we cover all the emerging markets, China being the largest of them. Okay, I want to stick on China for a moment here because what's your read on what the outbreak of the coronavirus in that country and really in the region, what does it mean for Chinese e-commerce and internet companies and their revenue? Well, that's a, a tough question and there's a lot of people uh, uh, pondering it. I mean, obviously China's GDP is going to be affected. Um, the, the growth will not be as much as it might otherwise have been. I think there's no doubt people will be spending more time on their smartphones <laughs> while they're uh, in self-quarantine or, or otherwise, but, but it's not clear whether they'll spend more money. Um, there will be some spending on things that are practical, but maybe uh, things that are more uh, luxury in nature um, will be uh, passed on until the situation stabilizes. So I think it's a mixed bag, but the long-term picture is uh, a secular story that's very much intact. And what about the trade situation? That's an ongoing thing when you think China. Phase one is done. Phase two, we're not sure what the timeline is. Clearly, flows are flowing into EM lately. So in, investors are uh, buying what's going on now. What's your take of further down the road of how this could affect uh, an ETF like yours? Well, he here's what I tell people about the situation, Eric. I actually got very bullish on EMQQ in particular and, and EM more broadly in the fourth quarter. And um, you know, the, the trade war has been hanging over uh, investors for two years now. And, uh, you know, if you, uh, it was really the, the day that the Houston Rockets general manager tweeted about uh, Hong Kong 
uh, and supporting democracy. And the next thing you knew, they were burning LeBron James jerseys. That day, I, I took a lot of comfort because I just thought about sentiment and the fact that we've had a full-on trade war with our largest, uh, the second largest economy in the world. Uh, we have the president of the United States threatening to delist Alibaba and you know, ha half of the companies that are part of EMQQ. Mm. You had uh, warfare in the streets of Hong Kong uh, slash China, basically. And, and then you throw in the LeBron James jerseys, and I thought you couldn't get any worse. Now, that was clearly I was wrong because we had uh, a conflict with Iran, and I, I got concerned that maybe I had jinxed us with that, and the market shook that off. This is a wild card with, with the virus, and, you know, if it's contained reasonably well, I still think the sentiment and, and flows, importantly, Eric, have been coming in the last couple months, and uh, we'll see if they can uh, withstand the virus. All right, Kevin Carter of EMQQ out in San Francisco. Thank you so much for your take. And of course, Kevin in, is in San Francisco. A lot of people in the Bay Area are very excited because it's countdown to kickoff, and the Super Bowl is almost here. However, the big game is a little too strenuous. Here's an ETF that embraces the future of sports. It is game on for the Vanek Vectors Video Gaming and Esports ETF. Ticker ESPO aims to track the ever-growing esports industry, which includes video games and the organized multiplayer tournaments that are streamed live. According to one estimate, esports will post average annual revenue growth of almost 18% between now and 2022, reaching a total of $1.8 billion. This would outpace growth in game software. And there's high demand for this content. The global audience for esports is estimated to reach almost 500 million this year. Half will be in the Asia Pacific region. Among ESPO's roughly 30 market cap weighted names, Tencent, Nvidia, Activision Blizzard, Nintendo, and NetEase. The US and Japan are the biggest geographies represented, followed by China, South Korea, and Singapore. ESPO has some $80 million in assets and an expense ratio of 55 basis points. And since launching in October 2018, ESPO has outperformed the S&P 500 and even the Communication Services Index. ESPO gets a green light in the Bloomberg Intelligence Traffic Light System. Now, I'm married into a 49ers family, so you know who I'm rooting for. Your Eagles are not playing this year. Do you care who wins? Um, well, I'm rooting for Kansas City because I think San Francisco's had enough. Sorry, you guys win all the time. Golden State wins. And Andy Reid is the coach, and he's indirectly responsible for the Eagles Super Bowl. So go, uh, Andy. Yeah. Okay, making that linkage. So yeah. it's been a long time since 1995, so I'm going with the 49ers. Kansas City has had enough pain. They need one. Okay, understood. That does it for Bloomberg ETF IQ. Be sure to catch us each Wednesday at 1 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg.